that seem to be to all around me and at many times myself to be pretty futile and hopeless. The campaign to get Britain out of the European Union. And I have to say, I want to thank tonight the initially dozens, then the hundreds then the thousands, and then the millions of people who had the guts to leave behind their traditional political parties, recognising and feeling, as I did, that this was the most important issue of our time. So I think I've just about got it into my head that today happened. So Tim Barrow, the British ambassador, went to Donald Tusk, who is the chairman or president, as they call everything over there, of the European Council, and delivered the letter that triggered... Article 50, Tusk was triggered. And that's it. In two years, we're out. Now, there are going to be huge debates between now and then about what happens to our fishing rights, our legal rights, our trade deals, the 3.3 million EU citizens living in this country. There's lots to talk about. There's lots to argue about. There is a peace to be won, but we've won the war. And today, we pass the point of no return. I, I campaigned throughout that referendum on the basis of we want our country back. Well, now... We've got our country back, and I'm very, very pleased about that indeed. Um, but I'm wondering, are you out there feeling as happy as I am? The Prime Minister has said that we must all come together. All I saw today was bitterness, anger and recrimination. No, not coming from ordinary people, but coming from our political class. But I was paid today a particular compliment. Lord Heseltine, and I remember before the referendum with Ian Dale in the chair, and he and I were in this studio for an hour's head-to-head -head debate, um, and I remember thinking, this man doesn't really like me very much. Well, this is what Lord Heseltine, former uh, Deputy Prime Minister, had to say about me today. The British people are fed up with eight years of economic stagnation and there's deep unease about immigration. And the, the, the beginning of the process was actually Nigel Farage. And we all know that the message that he had, the message that Donald Trump has got, and it's all interlaced with economic difficulties and immigration. Those are the two underlying issues. So there we are. According to Lord Heseltine, it is all my fault. I started everything. I've caused Brexit and I've caused Trump, according to Lord Heseltine. I am feeling really, really like a happy bunny this evening. And my question to you, and let me know what you think on this historic day, is do you feel as happy as me? Are you, are you sad? Are you angry? Are you, are you not sure? So if you're celebrating tonight as... Believe me, I'm going to be after this programme. Then you can call on 0345 6060973. -60 if you're deep in mourning, then you can, of course, text to 84850. If you're not sure, then you can tweet at LBC using the hashtag Farage and LBC. And you can watch the show live on LBC's Facebook page right now. Let's take our first opinion. I'm guessing we're going to get some quite strong emotions on both sides. I'm going to ask Chris in Bath. Chris, how do you feel on Trigger Day? Oh, I feel so deeply relieved and so happy about having the key to our cage unlocked. We're on the way. We're walking to the sunlit uplands of freedom. I've got my champagne <laughs> in the fridge. Have and you? I'm ready to celebrate. Well, Chris, it's seven o'clock. Why not crack it open now? Give me a couple of minutes. I don't talk and drink. Don't you? Oh, I do. In fact, funny enough, <laughs> funny, funny enough, Chris, I was due to do a whole series of... Um, I'd done some stuff in the morning, but I was due to do a whole series of TV interviews today on yeah. College Green, you know, where they all mill around and they set up oh, their yeah. tents and there was a big LBC tent there amongst all the others. And, and for, I don't know what it was, but I seemed to get... I, I went for a quick drink in the Marquis of Granby, Chris, and I, <laughs> and I, I some, somehow got stuck there. And um, I said to my... Press officer. I said, what time's that BBC Live hit? He said, it was 20 minutes ago. I said, oh, dear. We're in a bit of trouble. And then, do you know what happened? They all came to me. All the cameras came to the Marquis of Granby, and I sat outside doing all my press conferences. I didn't have champagne. I had a pint. But I'll tell you what, whether you drink champagne, as Chris does, or beer, as I do, or tea's your favourite thing, Chris, I'm with you. I think we should be celebrating today. And, and I, I think... Just, I also... Ju you know, I, know yeah. you, I know you sort of depreciate the thanks, but I can tell you now... For the few of us who are going to get through tonight, and on behalf of the millions who've quietly accumulated over the years, and I've been looking at this problem, this terrible trap that we've been manacled into yep. for 20 years now, and I cannot tell you 
how happy I am to be talking with you tonight and thanking you from the very bottom of my heart. Chris, thank you. Have a fantastic evening. And and I'm with you. I am wildly bullish and optimistic about our future as a self-governing nation. But I know that not everyone is going to feel exactly like that. I wonder how Matthew and Heathrow is feeling this evening. Oh, hi, Nigel. Well, basically, I mean, I was a Remainer. I accepted we've got to get on and get it done, so I'm pleased the process started. But I'm actually disappointed with Theresa May. I mean, Mm. she sort of said she wants to unite the country, and I think she should lead by example. I mean, she hasn't been able to unite the parties, and uh, she risks now breaking up the UK because of it. I mean, I think what she should have done in the first place it should have been a cross party, and now with the negotiations, she should use all the parties, the major players like yourself and wow. like Tony Blair and all the people with experience about it all. And I mean, has she actually since the referendum has she actually spoken to you and said, "Well, Matthew, you know, Matthew, I let, know you don't like him." <laughs> let, I, no, let me just say this, uh, Matthew. I feel that Theresa May was on the wrong side of the argument during the referendum. But, you know, she came through that and became the Prime Minister. Um, I have said publicly all the way through that if I could be of any value to the government, whether it's uh, with the Brussels renegotiations, whether it's perhaps forging some links or at least building some knowledge about Donald Trump and the team around him, that I am only too happy in a purely unofficial, unpaid capacity to help. And at no point in time have they (laughs) deemed it fit to speak to me. Um, And as you say, she's talked today about uniting people. And that does, you're quite right, that does actually mean attempting to bring political opponents together. Well, this evening, she's out doing a round of media. Uh, We have invited her onto this show this evening to speak to me, and I'm not going to try and score any points off her. In fact, far from it, if she was to have accepted Matthew, I would have said, what a very good speech I thought she'd given in the House of Commons today. And she's declined to come on this programme. And that would have been, I think given the bitterness that's existed politically between UKIP and the Conservative Party over the last couple of decades, it would, Matthew, have been quite a good symbol that when she talked about uniting people, she actually meant it. So, um, having said that, um, she has declined. But the lines are still open for a further 48 minutes, Prime Minister. And if you'd like to ring in to this show and say, why don't we try on this big issue, if nothing else, to work together in some way, then we're waiting for your phone call. So, Matthew, uh, your comments were very well timed and prompted. John in Henley on Thames, um, how are you feeling today? Absolutely over the moon, Nigel. Right. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> I poured myself a large scotch at lunchtime today and I'm over the moon. But I do believe it's time that people like Michael Hesitant and John Major, Tony Blair, should so show some solidarity and back the government in this difficult negotiations ahead of us. It's time to get together. Mm. Well, I would have thought... You do feel that. Yeah, well, I do, but I... Do you know what? I mean, for someone like poor old Heza, who thinks it's all my fault, he, of course has believed in this European project since the early 1960s. Uh, you know, he wanted us to join the Euro. He's never been apologetic or repentant about t- helping take us in to the exchange rate mechanism. Um, so some people, John, are, n- are never going to change their minds, and I think they will go on moaning and complaining and being negative forever. But I tell you, John, what is really interesting, and we've talked about this a couple of times over the last few weeks, the latest polling out this morning from YouGov showed that now 69% of voters in the country want the government to get on with Brexit. They accept the result and they think we should move on. So in a funny way, despite the fact Westminster is very deeply divided, I think what you'll see actually is the country itself is beginning to come together. John, enjoy the day, celebrate. Uh, The first text I've got here is, Nigel, you're a person who really uh, doesn't want to get out of Europe. Uh, It doesn't make sense because you're always there. You're taking people for stupid. If I was in charge, I'd ban you from travelling to Europe. Please read out my message. It's anonymous. How disappointing. The reason uh, that I've been going to Europe regularly since 1999 has been to attend the European Parliament and to do my very best to tell the British people what the European Union is, or, or was in some ways, uh, what it cost us, and why I thought we shouldn't be a part of it. And you know something, anonymous texter, I'm going to be going there a lot again between now and two years from today because actually what happens in the European Parliament in many ways will matter more than what happens in the Westminster Parliament. And I'll tell you a bit more about that as the programme goes on. Uh, 
One of the charming tweets that I get so many of here, why haven't you resigned yet? Well, Jez, you know, I'm sorry, mate, um, but I really think I've still got a job to do, particularly in Brussels. I wonder how Bob in West Drayton is feeling this evening. Bob, good evening. Good evening to you, Mr Farage. Well, may I call you Nigel? Uh, p- p- of course. Um, people, yeah, call, of course. people call me a lot of things, Bob, but Nigel's fine. Today is the dawn of a new morning. It's the, do- it's the start of a new era, and I'm really pleased. Um, I've never told anybody which way I voted, yep. because it's, you know, it's a private thing. But I'm happy that it's started. I'm happy for my country. Um, I think that a lot of people now need to work together. But I do have a question for you. Yeah. Um, and it, it's the, the it's been triggered today, and uh-huh. you're saying there is no turning back. So why has the government got to have a vote? Surely they can't stop it now, because I understood it. Once we signed Article 50, that was it. We were out two years' time today. We'll be out uh, of the single market. But it government have got to have a vote. So what are they going to vote on? If they turn around and say, well, you know, we don't like this, can they turn around and say, we're not going? Well, ultimately, the the big debate, and that, and that was the ping-pong game, wasn't it, that went on between the House of Lords and the House of Commons, uh, was whether, effectively, the House of Commons, at the end of this, could be able to stop the deal, uh, and they're not going to be able to. They will, th- they will be able to give an opinion on the deal, but actually very little more than that. So... This Parliament, Bob, this Parliament is not going to be able to stop whatever the government negotiates. Um, What is unclear... I mean, look, we've won the war, Bob, and that's why today's a big day of celebration. The question now will be, how do we win the peace? Um, And my concern, if you've been listening over the last few weeks, is we appear to be making way too many concessions before we've even got to the negotiating table proper. I think... Bob, the government is in a very, very strong position. The first thing I would do, if I was Theresa May, is I would say we are unilaterally going to guarantee the rights of the 3.3 million EU citizens that legally have come to this country and, and dare them, dare them, to throw out British citizens living on the Costa del Sol or in Normandy or elsewhere. They, of course, would not do that. Otherwise, they'd become international pariahs. And we would have won round one of the renegotiation. That's what I'd like to see. Uh, this, this has a long way to play out, but that, to me, would be a very good start. Right now, you're listening to The Nigel Farage Show on this great historic day of March the 29th, 2017. This is LBC. It's 7.15. Nick Ferrari at breakfast on LBC. Live from Westminster on this historic day. The first of Alex Salmon. Uh, Well, of course, it's a lot of nonsense, isn't it? I mean, what's the reality? But the reality is Northern Ireland's in deadlock. The Welsh are alienated. The Scots are having a referendum. England's split down the middle. uh, Former UKIP leader Nigel Farage. There is a degree of unity in the country of acceptance of the result. In Scotland, Nigel Farage? Well, we don't really know. But what I do know is this. A third of the SNP voted to leave. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Every weekday morning from 7. Only on LBC. With Hampton by Hilton. Now open in Aberdeen. All of us at QuickFit would like to say a big thank you to each and every one of our customers. That's why we're offering 20% off your next service and giving you little tips to keep you safe on the road this season. For example, did you know that an MOT doesn't actually guarantee your car will be safe to drive for the whole calendar year? Get down to your local QuickFit today to receive 20% off your next service. QuickFit, it's all about the service. Divorce. It threatens the things you've worked hard for in more ways than you can imagine. Your home, savings, pension, and most of all, your relationship with your children. Don't let divorce cost you any more than it has to. Cordell & Cordell is dedicated to helping men in matters relating to divorce. Call now on 0330-606161 or visit cordellcordell.co.uk office in central London a partner men can count on writing job descriptions managing candidates setting up interviews hiring's hard but indeed.com makes it easy post your job organise candidates schedule interviews all on the UK's number one job site and with more people in the UK using indeed than any other job site easy works Find your next hire at Indeed.com today. Terms, conditions, quality standards and usage limits apply. UK's number one job site based on total unique visitors to Indeed.com. 
the family member who was concerned, the neighbor who felt uneasy, the teacher who was worried, the coach who noticed at practice, and you. Child abuse. If you think it, report it. Visit gov.uk forward slash tackle child abuse to find out how. Together, we can tackle child abuse. Finally, it's spring. The days are getting longer. Time to gather friends and fire up the barbecue. Get your spring off to the perfect start with Weber. From the 18th of March until the 17th of April, buy a revolutionary Weber Genesis 2 gas barbecue, register it online, and get an iGrill 3 digital Bluetooth thermometer for free. Serving excellent food has never been easier. Visit Weber.com for more information. Weber for life. Let's start the meeting with a round of quick-fire questions. Whoever gets the most correct answers gets tomorrow off. First question. What's the most efficient way to manage our expenses? Concur. How can you capture supplier invoices electronically and manage approvals from anywhere? Concur. By switching to blank, we now have the tools that give us full visibility into company spend. Concur. Bob, you're the winner. You get tomorrow off. But tomorrow's Saturday. A deal's a deal. Oh. Expense. Travel. Invoice. Learn more at concur.co.uk. This is LBC, The Nigel Farage Show. Call 0345 6060 973. Text 84850. Tweet at LBC using the hashtag Farage on LBC. It's been Brexit Day today. Article 50 has been triggered. And in Westminster, we've had people like Lord Heseltine blaming me for everything. We've had Alex Salmond uh, and Nick Clegg virtually apoplectic. But there have also been some very happy Reese Moggs and people like me. Um, and clearly out there in the country, more and more of you coming, even if you voted the other way, to accept the fact that this has happened and we've got to get on. You know, we campaigned saying that we wanted to get our country back. We have now got our country back, and I'm really, really happy about that. But let me just tell you what's been happening across the other side of the water, because there's been no coverage of this at all in the British media. So you've seen the photograph of the British ambassador triggering, as it were, Donald Tusk and the European Council. But other things have been happening too. The European Parliament met, or the leaders of the European Parliament met this afternoon, and Mr Guy Verhofstadt, who has been on LBC quite a lot just recently, uh, presented a draft motion for a resolution. So what is going to happen is next Wednesday, the 5th of April, there will be in the morning a debate in the European Parliament. It'll be the first big public presentation of how the European Union sees the Article 50 process and sees the renegotiation. So the main speakers will be Guy Verhofstadt and Monsieur Barnier, who's been appointed by the European Commission to be their chief spokesman, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, the president, of course, of the European Commission. I don't know whether Donald Tusk will be there or not, but certainly the other three will be, and all the group leaders in the European Parliament. So I'm going to get a chance to have my say next Wednesday, which I'm quite looking forward to. We'll have the debate, we'll then have a vote, and this draft motion for resolution is, is kind of the first text. It won't be the final one, but I note, looking through it, that there is a line in there that they're going to ask the European Parliament to approve and pass that says it would be contrary to European Union law for the United Kingdom to begin in advance of its withdrawal negotiations possible trade agreements with third countries. So what already for Hofstadt and Co are saying is you cannot go and talk to Donald Trump. You cannot go and even talk to the Australians about having your own free trade arrangements once you've left the European Union. All of that must wait until you've left in two years' time. And I, I've said already on this show tonight that I think we should make a grand gesture to begin with, apropos the 3.3 million EU citizens living in Britain. But as far as this kind of thing is concerned, we have got to stand very firm from day one. Uh, the British government have to do what is in the interests of the British people. I do want us to finish up at the end of this with a sensible trade deal with the European Union. I know they need it far more than we do, but we can't give in on the idea that they can hold us back from becoming a truly global nation. On Facebook, Lorenzo, who's ever reliable, he's a regular, he says, you are a disgrace to your country and for the whole of Europe. Lorenzo, I tell you what, pick up the phone. 0345 973 Tell the people of this country, live on LBC, why I am such a disgrace. Keith says on Facebook, well done, you've broken Britain. United Kingdom is finished. Keith, you should have seen Alex Salmon today. You should have heard Alex Salmon today, earlier on, with 
Ian, at four o'clock. Um, the fact is uh, that a third of the SNP voted in that referendum to leave the European Union. And the idea that Scotland now is going to separate from the United Kingdom in order to try and sign a new treaty with the European Union, which would commit them to joining the Euro, says to me, actually, separation of Scotland from the United Kingdom is much further away than it was before we had that Brexit vote. So I'm feeling very happy. How are you feeling, folks? How's Banjal in Newham? How are you feeling, sir, this evening? I'm not happy or sad uh, today, Mr. Farage. OK. Uh, because I don't know the outcome. Obviously, this is a long process, so we don't need to celebrate today. Well, I'll tell you, Banjo, what the outcome... I mean, I'll tell you the one guarantee out of this. Yeah. Absolute yeah. guarantee. And yeah. that is, as a result of triggering Article 50, as a result of going past the point of no return, we will be, Banjel, for better or worse, richer or poorer, to a death us do part, we will be an independent, self-governing, democratic, normal nation, like about 200 countries out there around the world. We're going to be a proper self-governing nation, Banjo. What's not to like about that? That is the whole point. Uh, but in terms of success, uh, uh, we don't know which direction this, in terms of uh, certainty, we don't know where we're going to end up. However, I have this question for you, Mr. Farage. Yes. Um, since already the UK politics already forced it to sh focus back into UK independency, so why don't you join any of these other political party to build the country with this talent you have as a politician rather than pulling yourself aside because it is really long way even if you are in UK to to to, to come to and and to 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 implement uh, well, some of the UK objectives. No, so, I get that. I know. I understand the question you're asking. Of course, I do. Look, look. The form is. I've heard many times over the years the Conservatives say they were going to do Eurosceptic things, say they were going to control immigration for argument's sake, and Theresa May did that when she was Home Secretary, and then not deliver. Uh, now she sounded very sincere at the dispatch box today. In fact. It was almost like an echo chamber for me. She was saying things that I've been abused for for the last 20 years. But Banjal, firstly, you know, they have to deliver. And secondly, even though I've offered myself to help or cooperate in any way I can, they won't even talk to me. She won't even come on this show and say, isn't... I mean, she could say, Banjal, couldn't she? Here's a moment for us on these key points to work together. She won't do it. So, Banjal, I promise you, it is not... Uh, you know, from my side, I'm willing to help if I can. They don't want to speak to me, but I thank you for the point. It's a very fair one. Jason in Sutton, how are you feeling this evening? Do you know, it may surprise you to know that I'm actually delighted, and I say that as a Ramona. OK. Um, a Ramona. A <laughs> right. you know, I'm a Ramona and a Remainer and right. I voted Remain. Yep. Um, and let me tell you why. Um, You've already actually destroyed my hope um, in the first 25 minutes of your program. But right. I was delighted because today was the day that Project Fear died a death. Uh -huh. uh, Project Fear no longer exists. Now all we have is Project Fact because Article 50 has now been invoked. Yep. And the facts will be presented about the negotiations. And Brexiteers can no longer make it up as they go along. They can no longer dismiss Project Fear as fantasy and scaremongering and all the rest of it because it's real. In the draft motion that you mentioned earlier on to the European Parliament, yeah. it says things in there like it is impossible for the UK to be able to discuss trade talks in parallel with our divorce proceedings or the Article 50. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You know, um, we've been told for months and months and months that, uh, oh, don't worry about it. We'll come out of the two years with, a, with access to the single European market. We'll have access to the customs union. That draft motion also specifically says categorically that we cannot have access to the single market. We cannot have access to the customs union without accepting ah. the four principles of the... Ah, four ah. Of ah. The Jason, European Jason, Jason, Jason. Moment. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. Let's just get... Let's just deal with one word that you just used. Access. Every country in the world has access to the EU single market. The only question is on what terms, all right? What price? Well, the point is this. The point is this. I mean, on the first issue you raise, I'm not going to have Guy Verhofstadt 
telling us we're not allowed to enter, enter into talks with the rest of the world whilst we go through this process. We can't be bullied but that's the by law. people. No, I'm sorry, no, that's, the, that's international law. As a member of the well, European Union, we're well, committed. We have right the rules. Well, it thing. may well be, it may well be, Jason, under the rules that we can't sign a new trade deal, but there's nothing in those well, rules, yeah. there's nothing in those rules that prevents us from talking and discussing where we go in the future. We shouldn't See, be... The thing is, be no, we no, shouldn't I'm be bullied by these people. Sorry to interrupt, but, uh, I mean, at the moment, access to the single market is, is not as important as people think. What most people are forgetting to talk about is that 55% of our trade does not go to the European Union. I know. It's sold, listen, it's sold to 53 nations around the world under EU negotiated trade agreements over the last 40 years, including Australia and India, the USA and various other places. We have trade agreements with all of these No, we don't. Countries. No, we don't, actually, Jason. We don't. The EU does. The EU has made trade agreements around the world and done so on our behalf, and that's true. Uh, but actually, it's done very... It's very bad at this. It's very slow at this. Um, Singapore, Switzerland, South Korea and Chile have on their own, as relatively small nations, negotiated far bigger, greater global trade deals than the European Union has done on our behalf, Jason. And the other point, of course, is that you can, is that you can trade, you can trade without trade agreements, can't you? You absolutely can. And the chairman of the CEO, chief exec of the World Trade Organization, estimated that outside of, even with, in, 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 the, in the best possible deal we could get, where we retain membership of the single market and membership of the customs union, mm -hmm. but... We work on World Trade Organization rules with the other 53 countries that we lose our trade agreements with as a result of our leaving the European Union. Because the EU, under the best imagination of the world, are not going to allow us to trade under their agreements around the world after we've left. Well, actually, before and the Lisbon Treaty, Jason, before the Lisbon Treaty, every one, every one of those trade agreements before the Lisbon Treaty actually was also incorporated into law by our Parliament as well. I don't see any difficulty in us being grandfathered into those trade agreements, but even if we weren't, don't doubt our ability, you know, to go out there and forge our own way in the world. If little countries like Switzerland and Singapore can do it, I'm absolutely certain we can do it. And if you want to quote rules at me... All right. You know, Article 8 of the Lisbon Treaty says that the European Union has a duty to come to advantageous economic terms with its neighbours. It's actually written in because it was designed to show what a force for good the European project was. So are they actually going to try and turn their backs on us? All right. We've got a you know, we've got we've got that ditch called the channel between us, but we're still very close neighbours and we're their biggest export market in the world. Jason, I think. Common sense is going to come through here. I take it that you're deeply unhappy with the referendum result. Uh, you're right, we are now into fact, and in a couple of years' time we'll know exactly where we're going to be. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show on this historic day. It's LBC, it's 7.30, and time for the news with Rupert Barsia. The President of the European Council says the EU already misses Britain after the formal Brexit process was started. Article 50 was triggered this lunchtime. The Prime Minister says there is now no turning back from leaving the EU. Labour says it will hold the government to account every step of the way. And thousands of people have held hands during a vigil to remember those killed in last week's terror attack in Westminster. A silence was held on Westminster Bridge at 2.40, the exact moment the attack started. LBC weather. A mix of cloud and showers into the evening, a low of 10 Celsius. Tomorrow, cloudy and wet in the west, drier and brighter elsewhere, a high of 21 degrees. LBC Travel, good evening. I'm Claire Sharp. The M40 still has delays northbound from the M25 towards Junction 3 at Loudwater. One lane is still closed because of that serious accident earlier, but the M25 is looking better. In East Finchley, the A1 is partially blocked westbound between Kingsley Way and Hill Rise because of an accident. And in Bexley Heath, Crook Log is very slow eastbound at Brampton Road because of those roadworks. It's also causing delays northbound on Danson Road from the Danson Interchange. In Manchester, the M61 very slow southbound between the Kersley roundabout and Junction 3 for the Kersley Spur. Two lanes are closed for barrier repairs and in Cumbria the A595 has been closed in both directions between Homewood Road in Whitehaven and the Moore Road turnoff because of an accident causing long delays on both approaches. For more real-time traffic updates go to lbc.co.uk This is LBC This is a live update for UK businesses. Right now, the world needs the UK's trusted experience and knowledge in construction and infrastructure. Opportunities include building sports centres and providing innovative construction materials. 
to build your business internationally. Search Exporting is Great. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? I've climbed this leaning ladder, which you told me to fetch. But if I'm going to reach you, then I'll have to stretch. Well, I don't think it's wise that you should try to reach from there, for if you lose your balance, you'll be falling through the air. Oh, no, Romeo. When you're up a ladder, always keep your body weight centred and both feet on the rungs. Don't overreach. Move the ladder instead. Oh, I bet Rapunzel never had this problem. Are you confused about PPI? At PPI Hotline, we want to give you the facts. There is absolutely every reason to check you had PPI. Even if you think you never have, we can help you find out as you could be owed thousands. And now there's a deadline. We just need the name of the bank you've had loans or credit cards with and we'll check for free. So find out now if you're owed by texting WIN to 8322. PPI Hotline, text WIN to 8322. Last year, half a million apprenticeships were started in England. I'm here with Shelley Thompson from Angels Costumes to find out how apprenticeships have benefited their business. In the past, we found it really hard to recruit the right skill sets, but since launching our scheme, we can train apprentices to meet our business needs and give them the opportunity to earn, to learn and to progress their careers. We now have skilled apprentices who are moving up the ranks and making a huge contribution to our business. To find out how apprenticeships can work for your business, phone 08000 150 600 for free advice or search Get In, Go Far. When you need more space. Think creatively. What could you use a log cabin for? A studio, a home office, a den for the kids? Creative Living will design and build a log cabin to suit your needs, even taking care of electricity and climate control. See for yourself at our three large cabin display villages in Surrey. Find out where at creativelivingcabins.co.uk. You own a cabin, handcrafted, the creative living way. Finally, it's spring. The days are getting longer. Time to gather friends and fire up the barbecue. Get your spring off to the perfect start with Weber. From the 18th of March until the 17th of April, buy a revolutionary Weber Genesis 2 gas barbecue, register it online, and get an iGrill 3 digital Bluetooth thermometer for free. Serving excellent food has never been easier. Visit Weber.com for more information. Weber. For life. The Nigel Farage Show on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. It's a big day in British politics. It's a big day in our, in our nation's entire history. I have to say, pretty big day in my life after 25 years of campaigning and having been thought by most people to be mad, bad, dangerous and many other things. And I hear the Prime Minister using all the same phrases and terms for which I've been abused for the last 20 years. Big day. We have passed the point of no return. We are leaving the European Union. We're going to be an independent, self-governing nation, and I'm happy. And I'm asking you, are you deliriously happy, or are you very, very upset, or worried, or unsure? Do you want to ask a question? You can contact me, 0345 60 60 973. You can text me on 84850. You can tweet me on at LBC, not forgetting the hashtag, Farage and LBC. And you can watch this show live on LBC's Facebook page now. Uh, quite a lot of messages coming in on Facebook. Mitch says, I think during the negotiation process, any EU attempt to constrain our relations with other countries should just be simply ignored. Well, Mitch, I'm edging in your direction, mate, although, you know, in theory, we're not supposed to negotiate third-party deals. But then again, ever since that Lisbon Treaty was written, nobody before has actually left. And even if legally they can stop us signing a new deal with, say, America. They certainly can't stop us having the conversation. Mark says, can we stop paying into the EU now, Nigel? I'll tell you what, Mark, there's talk, is there not, about us having to pay a bill at the end and a big debate as to what that bill will be. Will it be massive? Will it be minuscule? Will it be non-existent? Why don't we count the money we're paying into the European Union from today, as these negotiations begin, as a start of any final payment there might be. Because do you know something, Mark? In the next two years, it'll be well over £20 billion net, over £30 million a day net that we pay into that union. So I think the clock 
and all of that should start ticking this very day. David says, Nick Clegg is probably in bed now with, uh, with hot milk and his teddy. I, I have seen Clegg a bit the last few days, and, 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 and I've tried to uh, make conversation with him. He, he, to be fair, you know, he hasn't completely ignored me. I suspect if I'd heard Heseltine, and we played that clip earlier on in the show, uh, I, th- I don't think Lord Heseltine would have been uh, as civil perhaps as Nick Clegg was. Jamie says on Facebook, as long as we don't go weak in the knees in the negotiations, Theresa needs to become the second Iron Lady and do what's good for us and not the EU. Jamie, I have been there all these years. I've watched these negotiations. I watched Tony Blair come into a press room after an all-night negotiation with the French. He looked haggard and tired, and he'd given away seven billion sterling of our national rebate in return for zero. Uh, And I reminded him of this, and he was very tired, and I think I'm the only person that Tony Blair has ever shouted at in public, and I'm really quite proud of that. Carol says, how stupid of us all, coming out of the largest market there is. Carol, Carol, listen, when we join the European club, it accounted for about 30% of global GDP. It now accounts for about 17% of global GDP, and by 2030, that will be down well below 10%. There is a big, exciting, emerging global economy out there. Funny thing is, a lot of them speak English, are members of the Commonwealth, and very much like us. Uh, and, And we've got a fantastic opportunity now for this country to go global. I thought Sir James Dyson was really interesting on this, did a big interview a couple of days back on the BBC, clearly a massively successful businessman. And, you know, he said, he said, look, our future, if we're going to be successful, cannot be tied too closely to Europe. We've got to get on with the rest of the word world. So I'm looking for all of you to ring me, Ramona's supporters, whoever you are, and I'm going to Copenhagen. I'm going to Malton in Copenhagen. Good evening. Good evening, Nigel, and good evening, Britain. So, it, it, it sounds a bit like the Eurovision Song Contest, doesn't it? So, how, <laughs> how many points do we get for triggering Article 50? Oh, you're breaking the scale. You get the absolute top point for this. We are so thankful. And even though the media doesn't show this, people are celebrating across Europe right now for yes. what's going on. Yes, yes. I was in, uh, I was in Copenhagen recently, um, and I did a big speech, but I went along. Um, to, to the Volkateng, your parliament, and met people. And the impression I got, Moulton, was that actually uh, Denmark is as Eurosceptic as the United Kingdom. You just feel a bit vulnerable, being five million people. But if we can make a success of Brexit, I think you're pretty close behind us, aren't you? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, the, the British vote has not just been for the 17 million of, of Britain alone. It has been for all of us. You are the true internationalist. Well, I, no, I like that. Thank you. Because actually we are. You know, the whole Brexit debate here was we don't want Europe tied in knots by a false political union. We want to trade and be friendly with our neighbours and reach out to the big growing emerging world. There was nothing backward or negative or protectionist about anything we said in that campaign, Moulton. I absolutely agree with that. And can I just say this to you, that... Theresa May, in the first paragraph of her letter, triggering Article 50, says she wishes the European Union well. Let me tell you, I don't. I don't want just the United Kingdom out of the European Union. I want Europe out of the European Union. I want a Europe of sovereign nation states that trade together and work together as friends. And I hope, Moulton, you won't be too far behind us. Thank you, sir. Thank Thank you you very much indeed for your call. And have a great night out in Copenhagen. It's hard there, in my experience, not to. Mark in Woolwich, how are you feeling about this this evening? Uh, hi, Nigel. I'm, uh, I'm absolutely delighted about it, but I don't believe um, what's happening till I see it, uh, the end result. OK, well, but, I mean, I, you know, I had callers and tweeters and texters in the last couple of weeks saying they, they weren't even sure whether Article 50 was going to be triggered. It has happened, Mark. I mean, do you agree with me that we have, in terms of our membership of this club, passed the point of no return? I do, and actually, I, I met you a number of years ago. I used to work for the Irish office in Brussels. Oh, OK. And, um, yeah, when the Lisbon Treaty happened for a second time, I wasn't very happy, but I was told that it was good for their jobs over there to keep it. But my understanding at the time, it wasn't good for Ireland and it wasn't good for um, Britain either. So for that reason, I'm glad that we're definitely out. Yeah, I mean, tell me about your experience working over there. I mean... I mean, did you get the feeling that actually this was the biggest gravy train that had almost ever been created? 
No, um, it definitely was like what um, it was definitely what they called the uh, the Brussels bubble. Yes, and uh, people were very isolated from uh, real life over there. They had discounts on food, um, tax off clothing, electrical goods. Yeah, if you spend more than hundred euros a day. Um, and the and the top tax rate, Mark. Just 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 to sort of broaden this out for the listeners to understand what Brussels is like. The top tax rate for anyone working for the European Commission or employed full time by the European Parliament is sixteen percent, isn't it? That's the top tax rate anyone pays over there. Yeah, yeah, no, they're, uh, they're looked after very well, and I think the reason that is because they didn't want people like myself or yourself upsetting the gravy train. Yes. So did they sack you, Mark? Um, effectively, did they? Yeah, they kicked me out early and then sent me back to a, a naughty chair back in Ireland. <laughs> Yeah, well, good. all I can say is many congratulations. They would like to have kicked me out many, many times. As an elected member, they've not been able to. And well done, Mark, for rejoining the real world and real people. And thank you. And just a thought on a, a, and a reflection on what Mark was saying. Have a think about this. There are 10,000 people working in Brussels who earn more than the British Prime Minister because of the salaries, allowances and taxes. And you wonder why. They want to try and hold this club together at all costs. Um, I, lovely. I, it's always Twitter, isn't it? Uh, Farage, you had a job in Brussels for years. Shame you never bloody showed up to it, says Declan. Declan, every day I show up, I can sign on for €300 Euros cash. No uh, explanation needed of how I spend it. So if I'd wanted to, I could have taken a lot, lot more of your money over the course of the last 20 years. I've been in Brussels this week. I was there for one day. I'm going to be there... Uh, in Strasbourg for three days next week. Um, I don't waste my time. I go there when I need to go there. I don't go there wholly unnecessarily. And in doing so, I've saved you money. Ha ha. Richard in West Morling. What is the feeling in West Morling tonight in your household? Well, it's 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 more a sense of relief than euphoria, Nigel. Um, yeah. But let, let me congratulate you and thank you at the same time as well. Because well, that's very sweet of you. For us, when other people were not, and you continue to do so. But a question I want to put to you is, um, Theresa May is talking about uniting the country at the moment, and I think we, we obviously we do need to be united because we, we are going to move forward and we've got, to, we've got to take people with us that, you know, are still not be persuaded, but it looks like other people who weren't persuaded before are coming over to our side and seeing yep. it now. But um, in her government, she's got people like Nicky Morgan, George Osborne, Anna Subri, opportunist career politicians who, uh, um, you know, didn't necessarily... <laughs> think, you know, well, there you go, you know, but they didn't... You know, they they wasn't happy with the way that we voted, and they're still been snapping at the heels of Theresa May, uh, even up until a couple of days ago. I, you know, I remember uh, Anna Thurby sitting next to Tim Farron um, having a go at you uh, in, in the past. So I just wanted to ask you, how do you think she should deal with those types of people? And as we do move forward, and as we do encounter a few bumps in the road, because, you know, even you said it yourself, there will be times when... There, there are going to be obstacles in the way that we will have to negotiate around, yeah. and you know, and and you know, get our way by whatever means. But we've also got this. this well, Richard, Richard, one thing she could do is to say, right, I am now going to hold a general election. It's going to happen on the on the first Thursday in May because we are embarked on a very historic and important mission. And if you want to stand for the Conservative Party, these are the principles that you must stand for. And perhaps then Anna Subri and George Osborne could go and stand for the Liberal Democrats with Tim Farron. That would be my suggestion. Dealing with opposition within political parties is never easy. You have to accept at times that people have different consciences. But if people like Heseltine are going to be just willfully destructive, what use is Lord Heseltine as a Conservative to a Prime Minister who said all the right things at the dispatch box today. Right now, you're listening to The Nigel Farage Show on this great historic day. It's LBC. It's 7.46. Coming up at 8 on LBC, Clive Bull. Article 50 has been triggered and the timetable set out. But what do you think will actually happen? Will Brexit have taken place in two years' time? Clive Bull on LBC. This message isn't aimed at you. You know that on a motorway, a red X above any lane means that you can't drive in it and could be prosecuted if you do. But apparently, there are some drivers who don't realise this and are a danger to themselves and to other road users. So those drivers do need to know that a red X above any lane means that the lane may be blocked by a broken down vehicle, emergency services or road workers. 
For more details, they should search online for smart motorways and never drive in any lane with a red X above it. You could spend days driving round lots of car dealers to find your next car, or you could sort it in an afternoon at Big Motoring World. With up to 2,000 pre-owned BMWs, Mercedes, Audis and VWs in stock, you'll save time to put in some hard hours at the gym or just chill on the sofa with a controller. Big Motoring World, just minutes from the M25. See bigmotoringworld.co.uk. Big, big, big Motoring World. Let's start the meeting with a round of quick-fire questions. Whoever gets the most correct answers gets tomorrow off. First question, what's the most efficient way to manage our expenses? Concur. How can you capture supplier invoices electronically and manage approvals from anywhere? Concur. By switching to blank, we now have the tools to give us full visibility into company spend. Concur. Bob, you're the winner. You get tomorrow off. But tomorrow's Saturday. A deal's a deal. Oh. Expense. Travel. Invoice. Learn more at concur.co.uk. Finally, it's spring. The days are getting longer. Time to gather friends and fire up the barbecue. Get your spring off to the perfect start with Weber. From the 18th of March until the 17th of April, buy a revolutionary Weber Genesis 2 gas barbecue, register it online, and get an iGrill 3 digital Bluetooth thermometer for free. Serving excellent food has never been easier. Visit Weber.com for more information. Weber, for life. Let's talk about you. The, I'll walk tomorrow you. Mm. The, go on, I'll have a second helping you. The, give us a minute, love, you. The heart disease you. So how about the enough is enough you? Start the fight back to a healthier you. Join over a million people who've taken the One You Health Quiz. See how you score. Search One You. Last year, half a million apprenticeships were started in England. I'm here with Oliver Mangum from Fairfield Control Systems to find out how apprenticeships have benefited their business. We had a skill shortage and we had to come up with a creative way of finding more engineers. The benefits of apprenticeships are massive, just from the boost in morale, the retention rate and the skills they bring into your business. And without the apprentices we just won't be able to achieve our goals. For me it's a no-brainer. To find out how apprenticeships can work for your business, phone 08000 150 600 for free advice. Or search Get In, Go Far. Leading Britain's conversation, The Nigel Farage Show. Tweet at LBC using the hashtag Farage on LBC. Well, on this historic day, we've got ten minutes left on this show. So, Prime Minister May, we've invited you on. You want to unite everybody? It's your chance to make me united behind you in this great quest. Please ring us, Prime Minister, 0345 606973. And any Ramonas out there who really need to get it off their chest and have a go at somebody, you can call too. I wonder what John in Enfield is going to say to me. Nigel, hi. Good evening. The 18 billion that we give to the EU uh -huh. every year, where will the EU find that money once we've left? Well, John, I suggest it, it's one of the reasons they're a bit cheesed off, because it's a net 10 billion every single year. You know, we contributed around about 15% um, of their finances. Uh, yeah, they're not going to be happy uh, that we're leaving. Uh, they've, made, they've made no contingency plan for it, which is why Mr Juncker you know, after a good lunch, wants to give us a bill for about 60 billion euros, and it's why we have to say, no, we're very, very sorry, we're not going to do that. And I repeat the point, John, far as I'm concerned, our final cheque to the European Union begins today, and every penny we pay in the course of the next two years should be considered as being towards that final settlement bill. Does that sound reasonable? But you know that's not going to happen. Well, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, maybe this Prime Minister... Uh, is going to be lion-like in her defence of British interests and your money. One other thing, <laughs> Nigel, if I may. Yeah. James O'Brien constantly calls you a racist liar on yeah. his show. Do you know something, John? When I first got into politics, a very wise man, journalist called Christopher Booker, been around for decades, and somebody had said something very rude about me. And I was thinking of going to the libel lawyers and suing. And Booker said to me, that there was Admiral Jackie Fisher, who ran the Royal Navy before the First World War and was a very great man, had a saying about people who were rude to him. He said, if you pick a fight with a chimney sweep, you get covered in soot. And you know something? I don't want to sink to James O'Brien's level. I do, though, occasionally turn on 
the James O'Brien show because it really gets my blood up and makes me determined to go out there and do all I can to destroy the European Union. John, I thank you very much for your call. Any mention of money, uh, of course, uh, gets you all very excited. And Louise, talking about my week in Strasbourg next week, says €900 Euros over three days. Nice work if you can get it. Yeah, all right, Louise. Don't have a go at me. Have a go at the ones that are going to be there for five days next week and probably do less than I will do. And Anne says, what happened to our Independence Day holiday? Well, Anne, I couldn't agree with you more. A London cabbie shouted out uh, today... Um, of the cab. He said, um, a great day, Nigel, but not as good as the 23rd of June. And I agree with that. And I do think in future, June the 23rd should become UK Independence Day. The Americans have July the 4th. It should be ours. I will keep arguing for it. Keith in Henfield in West Sussex. Are you a happy man this evening? I'm a very happy man, Nigel. I've met you a couple of times and I'm, I'm actually delighted and again, very grateful for everything you've done. Yep. I hope now that you'll be able to use your influence to look at the way that they adopt the correct um, negotiation strategy. It seems to me, as an experienced negotiator, that what we need to do is look at all the common ground where there are things that would suit both parties, yep. which is about 90% of what we have now, and, and concentrate on real objectives rather than conditional objectives. I mean, it is in the EU's interest to have free trade with us. Absolutely, Keith, it is. And yet, you know, we get this sort of opening shot from Mr Verhofstadt... Uh, where clearly he's more interested in preserving the crumbling project that is European Union than he is in doing a good deal for the German car makers, for the French wine producers, the Belgian chocolate manufacturers. Keith, you're absolutely right. What I think we need to do is this. I don't think uh, that our renegotiation here should be focused purely on the rooms and corridors of Brussels. I think what we ought to be doing is to be going down to Munich and talking to the trade unions that work in the car in the car business. We need to be going to the you know you know the wine growing parts of France and talking to them. I mean they sell us nearly 80 billion pounds worth a year more goods than we sell them. We need to make it a political issue that French and German and Belgian voters are screaming at their governments carry on with a free trade relationship with the United Kingdom, because if you don't and we get tariffs, it's us that's going to get hurt and not the British. And, Keith, that would be my idea of how we can push this negotiating strategy. And I, I throw it back to you as an experienced negotiator. Would that be a reasonable approach? Absolutely, and I'd volunteer to talk to the wine areas. I speak French. Well, I'll come with you. <laughs> I'll come with you. Keith, I thank you very much for your call. Uh, Fernando in Reading. Fernando, how are you feeling about Article 50 and us having passed the point of no return? Hello, Nigel. Nice to meet you. Um, well, first and foremost, I'm a bit concerned because as a youngster we're getting told constantly that your lives are going to be ruined and you're not going to be able to afford a house and you're going to be renting all your life. Who's telling you so this Fernando? Who's telling you this? Who is telling you this? Everyone. Everyone. Uh, lecturers. Oh college. yes, I thought it might be. <laughs> the, the lot. So I'm interested why are you guys standing there going, oh yeah, this is brilliant when actually for us as a you know, the common people, yeah. as, you, as you like to say, why is it going to be so hard for us and why are you celebrating about it if it is? You know, it's all well and good you sat there with your money, but us, I, we haven't got a lot of money and we have to work a bit. Yeah, yeah, Fernando, believe me, you know, I'm not in George Osborne's league or Cameron's league or even Jeremy Corbyn's league when it comes to money, but that's not the point. Fernando, I believe that one of the big problems with the European Union is that big politics and big business and big uh, banks have worked hand in glove. They've made life incredibly difficult for small and medium-sized businesses, men and women, trying to get their own show up, you know, on the road. And in terms of housing, look, our population, Fernando, is rising by half a million people every single year, uh, and the lion's share of that is directly because of immigration. And actually, if we have lower immigration numbers, there'll be fewer people chasing those houses. It might just give you half a chance. But just a very interesting quick point is this, Fernando. You know, you mentioned the word lecturers, and there's something rotten in our education system. We're not teaching people objective thinking. We're not giving them a chance to see both sides of the argument. Fernando, I thank you. And the last call I'm going to have this evening is Bavin in Croydon. Bavin, good evening. How are you feeling tonight? Well, the thing is, I, I'm a Remainer, and uh -huh. was. But when we... When the will of the people was triggered and it was there, and you know what, I'm a realist, you know what, there's no need about crying about spilt milk. We get in there, we make the best of what we've got as a remainder. 
you, we are, we've triggered it and we knew it was going to get triggered and it's being done now. Yep. What I have, what I want to tell you, uh, Nigel, is, I mean, you've done your bit and now I think you're doing a disservice to all that you've done so far by actually calling all Remainers and Remoners, no matter what they do. They no, are I'm not. No, People no, I'm not. Oh, no, no I'm not. Finish, Nigel. Go on, finish. Of course, I'm not being rude. I'm not being rude about you, am no, I? No, you know, you, no, you no, made your mind rude. up. No, no, no. I know what I said is um, I, I would love to have been there. But thing is, you get behind what's happening and you're realist. You live in today. Mm-hmm. But by you terming people as remoners, I mean, if you took the higher ground and said, you know what, your remainers would love to have remained in rather than calling them remoners. And that's just. Bavin, 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 I take the point. Listen, there are about one in five people who voted in that referendum, who voted Remain, that's one in five of the total vote, have now decided that Brexit is the right thing for this country to do. I'm not criticising those. Those that I call Ramonas aren't ordinary people. It's people like Clegg and Hesseltine and Subri, and particularly Hesseltine. Hesseltine. I'll have to go to bed and try not to think about what Hesseltine said today. He said it was all my fault. Well, thank you, Lord Hesseltine. If it really was all my fault, I'm enormously proud of the fact that Article 50 has been triggered today. I would ask people to rejoice. This is a big, happy day. Uh, We are going to get our country back. It's what many of us campaign for, in my case, for 25 years. And my advice to the Prime Minister is be magnanimous say that the 3.3 million EU citizens who came here legally have their rights fully respected, but from here on, things are going to change. Uh, And by doing that, you win the opening round. And whatever Verhofstadt says and Barnier says next week, in time, in time, it'll be European companies and European workers forcing their politicians to come to a sensible deal. You've been listening to the Nigel Farage Show on this historic day. I'm back tomorrow evening from 7, coming up at 10. It's Ian Collins, but up next, it's Clive Bull. Thank you, Nigel. So, coming up at 9, it's your chance for some free legal advice. Barrister Daniel Barnett from Outer Temple Chambers joins me for the legal hour, taking your questions at 9 o'clock. First, though... Article 50 has been triggered and the timetable set out. But what do you think will actually happen? Will Brexit have taken place in two years' time? Will negotiations have finished by October of next?